Chair Delaney of uh, University of Nebraska Omaha. Uh, and then we also have Kathleen McCarty Smith of the University of North Carolina Greensboro. Um, so we welcome them and Claire, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Um, let me just get this all set up. Okay, can y'all see my slides? Great, thank you. Um, okay, so um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending my lightning round presentation titled Assessing Archival Instruction Through an Active Learning Survey. My name is Claire Dulaney, I use she, her pronouns, and I am the Outreach Archivist and the History Subject Specialist at the University of Nebraska at Omaha Libraries. So in this lightning round presentation, I will address the instruction assessment project I have been working on informally since the spring of 2021, and more formally starting in spring of 2023 with what I call an active learning survey. The survey is organized so that students can follow along during an archival and history instruction session and answer questions or conduct discrete research instances while I am teaching. The formal survey uh, in 2023 was created after researching archival instruction and assessment literature, um, exploring archival learning outcomes and connecting them with my library's 2022 instruction student learning outcomes and working with library colleagues to craft survey questions that would provide the most precise data. I will explore the process of creating and launching the survey and conclude with final thoughts about the survey and where I hope the data and experience using it will lead. Um, one point of clarification is that I am not a data librarian, so this is my first foray into this type of data collection and management. So when I started working on this project in spring of 2021, I did not necessarily set out to create an instruction survey. The initial iterations of this project were simply a means for me to better conduct online archives and history instruction sessions while many of our classes remained virtual in the direct aftermath of the pandemic. I had found that when I was teaching virtually, I had very little student engagement, which I think was a pretty common problem. Through professional development opportunities and working with the Teaching with Primary Sources Collective, I started employing Padlet, as a lot of us have, um, to encourage students to answer and ask questions in a less public way than unmuting their microphone. Um, for those of you unfamiliar maybe with the contours of the program, Padlet is a cloud-based collaborative software that acts as a virtual bulletin board. You can create sections where people can comment, answer or ask questions, vote, et cetera, and then export the data as a PDF or CSV, um, though the latter never worked out for me. Um, but despite that, it was really helpful for my purposes. So some of the questions that I asked, I had been asking in various ways since I started at my institution in 2019. Other questions were added during the pandemic teaching, which is why you see the title here is 2019 fall to 2022 fall aggregate questions, even though I did not start recording the data in a systematic way until fall of, uh, until, excuse me, until uh, 2021. So uh, this is the Padlet data from four classes uh, in spring of 2021 to fall of 2022. The data pool is small because not all classes lent themselves to an in-class survey. So I teach mainly one-shot instruction sessions for a multitude of classes uh, and disciplines that include history, Native American studies, art, women and gender studies, sociology, political science, and others. Um, so some of the early Padlet questions would vary, would vary depending on the class or what teaching faculty had requested, but there was a basic framework um, for questions that included, um, what are some questions that you have for me at the beginning of class? Or have you used archival material for research or a project before? Um, if so, what were things that you liked and what were some challenges? Or a database question, such as take three minutes and search for an item about your research topic, make a few quick notes about how you're entering the search terms and using the filters. What did you learn about the databases and, and how you search? 
Um, questions that were only asked for certain questions, which are labeled SQ or special questions, mainly dealt with specific assignments, such as um, what course assignment, abstract book, book review, annotated bib, et cetera, has been the most interesting, helpful, or challenging, and why, and what were some challenges about historical research that you didn't expect. So the first class I used the Padlet with was a sociology class, Introduction to LGBTQ+. I created a simple Padlet with six questions. The data was small but enlightening. As you can see, no student had knowledge or wanted to share prior knowledge about archives. 30% uh, of students had conducted primary or archival research. 91% of them thought of the term old or some variation when asked about archives, though one student did answer with, quote, personal or community-based materials when thinking about archives. And you can see on the slide the remaining questions and then my summary of the answers from class. Um, so it was during this time, starting in August of 2021, that I became the library liaison for the history department and took over the bulk of teaching and research consultations in addition to my archival instruction and research support. The subsequent Padlets and questions here were done with history classes from fall of 2021 to fall of 2022. And um, again, we're a little bit more tailored to an assignment, which is reflected in the questions on the screen. Um, the results were quite similar to the SOC class. Students reflected on the challenges. There were fewer dusty comments about archives, but still some. Uh, two students felt more confident and excited to learn more, while two of the five students who responded were actively nervous or intimidated by primary source research. So the small pool of data indicated that I was helping students with their research, but I wanted to better understand their needs and how I could support their research more effectively. The process to a final survey was complex and included transferring Padlet and later surveys into Excel. And for like a glorious minute, I understood pivot tables. Please don't ask me to make one now. Um, I solicited feedback from instructors. You can see an example of this on the slide um, about courses with an archives or history session. I researched instruction survey and assessment learning outcomes and matched those as best I could with the learning outcomes created by my organization so that I could cohesively support um, the existing framework created by the library. Through numerous drafts uh, and iterations and working with colleagues to streamline and clarify the questions, I had a Qualtrics survey ready to go by the fall of 2023. Um, so I formatted the survey to be what I have called an active learning survey. I don't think I came up with that term. It just it made sense for what I was trying to do. Um, students would follow along with it during my instruction session, answer questions, ask questions, and conduct discrete activities within the class and the survey where they would then reflect on the session and what they learned. I formatted my PowerPoint presentation to follow the contours of the survey, and I entered the semester ready to launch and gather data. Um, overall, the survey has been very helpful, but there have been challenges, some of which I did not foresee. One challenge was teaching faculty posting the survey to Canvas, our learning management platform, and then telling students to fill it out prior to my instruction session. This led to confused data for some classes, as many of the questions were framed as rate your level of comfort before and after the session. The survey also didn't really consider the lower level courses that didn't have a research component, so the activity about um, finding it, researching a topic and writing down search methods um, was challenging as I would have to come up with a topic on the fly. This would then throw off the whole survey flow as entire sections had to be skipped. Um, finally, I didn't anticipate the number of repeat students I would have during the semester. I had many students who took the survey two or three times over the two semesters, which again affected the data because their comfort and confidence did not necessarily improve over the course of the class. Um, overall, I had 78 responses to the survey in two semesters. So despite these challenges, this has been a really helpful process. The data collected does tell an important story, and significantly, when one class followed the survey perfectly, it told a story that said I was on the right track in adjusting the instruction sessions. You can see from this one class that confidence increased in finding and using primary sources, and there was an increase in finding and using secondary sources also. Uh, this experience has also confirmed what I already suspected, that I needed to create a tiered approach to instruction, one for intro classes and one for upper level courses. I do this already informally, but it would be better to have it standardized. I plan on taking the summer to adjust the survey and how I organize my instruction sessions. 
This may mean having two different surveys for various levels of classes, or just being more diligent about getting a syllabi from a teaching faculty so that I know if the students have a research assignment, um, I can then incorporate it into the uh, learning assignments. From what I've gathered, this method at its foundation is really useful. It just requires a lot of work and adjustment. Um, I definitely did not expect to get it right the first time the survey went live, and I'm looking forward to future versions of this and the insights they provide. Thank you. Kathleen, if you're talking, we can't hear you. You might no, need to I'm unmute. Not talk I'm not talking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I didn't know if we were going to make a formal transition or I just go ahead and start. Just roll on out. All right, I'll do it. Um, that was a great presentation, Claire, by the way. It was really interesting to see that survey. Um, my name is Kathleen Smith. I'm the department head at the Martha Blakeney Hodges Special Collections and University Archives um, at UNCG. University of North Carolina at Greensboro. And I also coordinate our department's instructional outreach. So let me see if I can turn this. Um, so I'm really happy to be here today talking about archival assessment. Believe me, believe me, those are words that I never thought that I would, would say. Um, but after teaching in archives for the last 14 years, I've really become increasingly aware of how important assessment is. And now I'm a really big fan. Um, when I began, in, in, let's see, archival instruction, um, most of us were satisfied with kind of a simple hand raise from students acknowledging that they understood the process of primary source evaluation. But increasingly, it became clear that this was just not really an effective way of assessing whether students were meeting the learning goals that we had established um, for each class and how we as archivists could better um, meet those goals. Yet, as you know, assessing, assessing the um, success of these instructional sessions proves sometimes challenging, as each class group is at a different level based on the year of study, the complexity of their professor's curricula, and related class projects. So creating a flexible assessment system that would meet the needs of a diverse cross-section of classes was essential to determine not only the learning impact of the class sessions, but also to help the archivists in our department understand um, where we could improve our instructional efforts. So we met the problem by developing a system of assessment that incorporated different levels of evaluation forms and associated in a, an associated rubric that would satisfy the needs of every instructional level and align with the standards reflected in the RBMS ACRL guidelines for primary source literacy. So just to give you an idea of our school, we are um, said we were in, located in Greensboro, North Carolina. We have about 18,000 students, about 14,000 of those are undergrads. Our department has about 10 full-time staff members and most of us do teach classes. Um, we teach approximately 150 in-person and online classes per year across 26 campus departments and programs. Okay, so as I mentioned before, um, when I first, came aboard about 14 years ago, we didn't really have any kind of a formal way of assessing things. We just kind of, um, we just casually ask students how, to, how they were getting along and, and that worked out fine at the time. Um, but then we started really kind of getting on board with the whole idea of corresponding worksheets. And we did that for a while as well. And then several years ago, but, you know, before COVID, um, our ROI, our reference librarians downstairs were also um, starting to more deeply consider some kind of assessment and we started talking more about it and this kind of put us in mind as well and then meanwhile the fra the uh, framework for information literacy um was uh being developed by roi they were they were kind of using that and our guidelines came into play too so all of it kind of came together um kind of for a perfect storm so why assess archival classes um well of course we all know that it's to ensure that you're that you're really covering what the learning objectives are for archival visits. And this isn't only the professor's um, objectives, but also ours as archivists, uh, to really make sure that they're engaging with the material, kind of judging that, and to guide, guide, help guide students through these online evaluation processes. 
Um, and also just judging the impact of the exercise. Okay, so when the guideline for primary source literacy came out in 2018 or when it was solidified, uh, it really kind of helped pull all this together for us as far as um, assessment sheets and this rubric, because it really kind of navigated through this complication and it standardized the skills needed to walk students through primary source evaluation. Um, and that's what we used as well. Um, Y'all familiar with this? And I think that Claire mentioned these two. So it's conceptualize, find and access, read, understand, and summarize, interpret, analyze, and evaluate. We use really those, um, those headings. We didn't really bring in use and incorporate. That's not kind of what we were doing with our kind of mostly one-offs. So we just concentrated on the first four. And this was the, the what we kind of called the super rubric that we created. And if you look carefully, kind of how we've done this is um, on the left, on the left column, you see that conceptualize, observe, interpret, analyze, and evaluate, and find. And then what we did at the top was we incorporated the three different class levels that we mostly dealt with. So on the far right, it is expected for lower level classes. And when I say that, I mean like 100 level classes, or sometimes it might be 200 level classes that were really not planning an archival project, but their teacher really just wanted them to come in and dip their toe in um, to the archives. Then we had the intermediate level classes, which just kind of walked a little bit further. So um, in, initially for our lower level, we wanted to make sure the student left the archives, being able to, con to, to distinguish between primary and secondary sources, identifying an archival resource, um, the knowing what the creator was and being able to identify that with whatever uh, primary source was in front of them and to articulate where a similar primary source could be um, found. So I want to make sure that y'all understand. We we went into we delved into a lot more material, but we just wanted them to walk out with this information. Then in the intermediate level, we we bumped up a notch, and we wanted to make sure they could um, also understand that this could be used for research. Um, they could uh, not only identify the the research the resource itself, um, but the unique physical qualities of it. Um, then we wanted to make sure they could also um, understand that that using primary sources could bring in different various perspectives and biases. And then um, we kind of broadened a little bit at the fine level for students to recognize how primary sources related to archival collections. And then finally for upper level classes, three and 400 level, we, we jumped up another notch, um, as you can see to the far left. And um, this is basically how they integrated the material um, a little bit more deeply into observing. Um, and then finally in, fi in fine, we brought in digital material and made sure they understood about interpreting metadata. Um, but when we, we kind of filled out our rubric, we scored it from one to three on the right-hand level, and then we totaled out. And this really kind of gave us an idea um, of, of what the class was doing, but it allowed us to kind of use this super rubric for all of the evaluation sheets. And then we kind of standardized some basic evaluation sheets. So this is, this is what was handed out to them. So I said, it's very simple, but this was just a baseline, what we wanted them to get out with. And then we had a lot of other discussion of, as uh, well. And this was worksheet two and three, again, bumping up at each level. And it seemed to work really well. I mean, because it established what they were getting out of the course and also what we, what we were not giving them. So if we noticed that there was just an area that they were consistently not answering, that made us re kind of relook at how we were, we were really talking about that area. Um, and just black and white, it, it, was, it was very clear. Now I wanted to, to mention as well that um, we didn't use this for all classes. Um, a lot of the, um, you know, a lot of the, the staff in our department, um, you know, didn't necessarily have classes that it, it worked well with. And for example, the worksheets that you see on, on the screen are mostly for um, uh, photograph analysis. And we do a lot of that. It didn't work out quite as well. We wanted to delve in a little bit to it. Most of the people that were coming, most of the classes that were coming and talking about this um, were a little higher level anyway. So I just want to say this, this, this just covered a rather smallish or medium sized um, um, class range that we taught. 
Okay, but I also wanted to say that one of our favorite things um, for these assessment sheets were the great doodles that we had. And I've always wanted to bring some of these out, but these are some of my favorite. Now I have to say that these all, um, that th they filled out their sheets, but as we all know, st students are sometimes go at a different level when they are doing their evaluations. And uh, these were, I think, I've tried to figure it out. I think these were mostly art classes, as you can see, but um, they did the, they do these great doodles on the uh, side of the assessment sheets um, when they're finished. So I just want to say overall that I think this has really worked out for us. Another thing we were able to do, unfortunately, this kind of was coming to fruition about the time that um, that COVID was hitting, but we were able to align our super rubric with the one that the reference librarians were also doing. And we, we had a yeah, high hopes of actually trying to combine them in some way, and we just haven't done that yet, at least in kind of comparison. But that is how far we have gotten now. Uh, this is just a few types of sources. If you um, if you're not working with a, with a assessment sheet a worksheet, these are some sources of where you can find great ones. The Society of American Archivists has some um, wonderful ones, and I don't know if y'all are familiar with Library of Congress and Digital Public Library of America, they actually have primary source sets. A lot of them concentrate on um, the K through 12 experience, but if you're not used to doing a lot of this, especially um, online, you might check with those too because they're really great and they're adding to them all the time. So that is my very lightning talk. Wonderful. Thank you, Claire and Kathleen. Um, at this time, we're going to open it up for questions. Um, again, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat or you can unmute yourself. Um, we have a question already in the chat. Um, they said, do either of you see this being implemented in freshman or orientation classes to help students learn how to use these resources as they enter college? I mean, I think ideally that would be amazing to have um, even just like a section of one of their orientation classes that focused on primary sources. Um, we we don't do that here. Um, it's kind of up at, at my institution, at least it's up to me to kind of connect with, with teaching faculty and get students and classes in. Um, I think, I mean, I think it would be great. I think it could be a little overwhelming for a lot of students. And I think it would take um, some careful nuance to to make sure we didn't lose students and thinking I'm not I'm not doing history I don't need the archives but um, ideally I think that would be really fun. We do um, we do lower level groups and sometimes those are freshmen. A lot of times when we have that level in or they're just in for for a short amount of time we don't do kind of um, you know basically sit down and delve into it primary source evaluation. We'll use something. Um, something very visual, like maybe we have these great World War I and World War II propaganda posters. They're big, they're visual, we'll put those out on the table and we'll walk through those and we usually don't use evaluation forms for those because um, it's just too much um, and they really, they're not sitting down. So we do we do a lot of that type of things with, with students that come through either with something like with orientation, freshmen, or even when high school students visit us, that works out really well. Any other questions, <clears throat> comments? <laughs> I was just gonna say, we actually did something similar here with doing evals at the start of a semester and then at the end to see if we were moving the needle at all uh, with our one of our uh, sort of, in, we called them reverse embedded research skills classes. Uh, where we tried to embed the class in the archives rather than embedding the archivist with the class. Um, and so one of my colleagues, has, she was working on that for a while, was developing a, a Qualtrics uh, survey to, to, to send to the students. And I used it last semester uh, and happy to report that they, they were, <laughs> they were re reporting that they, they did feel like they had, uh, developed just a new skill. So anyway, if anyone wants to see yet another variation on this, um, I'm happy to share what we were, what we've been using.
mean, I have I have one sort of related question for instruction, uh, which, which is that here what we've noticed is that they absolutely cannot cite a source to save their lives, uh, and present when asked for bibliographic bibliographic information, they actually don't know what bibliographic means. Uh, and so that's like the first hump to get over. So I actually resorted to doing like a little Mad Libs at the beginning of the of the worksheet to try and get them to like even just be able to identify the pieces of the citation. So I'm just wondering if anyone else has any um, any tricks or anything else that they've tried to help the students learn how to cite. Hey, um, I'm Kirsten. I'm at a K-12 uh, school, actually. But uh, one of our teachers, I'm, I've been trying to get software archive space, and I had one of the teachers looking at it, and she got excited over the cite button on there. Because what she wants to do is do reverse citation with her students so that they see the reasoning for why you need to really cite things well um, because they don't understand why they need to but if she were to give them the citations and have them try to find the uh, items then they'll realize why they need to do it and maybe get a little better at doing it. Anyone else have any questions or comments? Um, I do. I'm Jerry Ann Schott and I'm in Texas and I don't, I'm new here, so I have no clue of where a camera is. Um, <laughs> ACRL, I think, um, does have a segment on um, visual literacy. And so maybe there's something helpful there, which would teach how to do citations. Um, I, yeah, that, that's, <laughs> as my mother would say, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Never quite <laughs> understood that, but that might be the case. Sorry. The, we, we do try explaining to them, usually individually in the, in the reading room, uh, about why citation is important. So like if someone needs to check what you said or they also want to use the source that you used, it, it helps if they can tell us the collection and maybe even the box and the folder. And we don't have to play a guessing game with now over 900 manuscript collections to figure out uh, which materials they're looking for. And usually they're like, oh, I'm like, yes. Well, if, if we do a class, if we do a class live guide, we always include a tab on citations. And I think when, especially when students come in with some kind of project, because we've, because we've learned the hard way, we always beg them to take, like if they're taking, you know, pictures with their phone, about with sources to please, you know, take a picture of the folder and the box. Otherwise, we can't even help you um, cite it. So that's something that we've started because we've we've had our experience with students coming at the end of the semester and desperately holding up a, a picture on their phone and say, "Where did we get this?" We like we have no idea. Uh, I would point out, I'm Jim Cross from Clemson University Library Special Collections and Archives, that it's not just students. There are faculty who have no idea how to thoroughly cite an archival collection. You know, they, they'll, they'll give the manuscript, they might give the series, but you know, boxes and folders and things like that. I mean, so it's not just a student thing. Yeah, 
you know, we've also noticed that the thing that tend, tends to throw them is the concept of repository. Like they'll fill in everything else, but then they'll look at us and be like, what, what repository? I'm like, where are you sitting right now? They're like, uh, like Mitchell Memorial Library Special Collections. They're like, oh, and then also, I mean, this may be another useful teaching tool is that sometimes we get citations that are correctly cited, but the information in them is wrong. Uh, it's like we got one reference question with a citation uh, for uh, for a 19th century document relating to uh, to letters from Liberia that had been had been mysteriously to all of us cited to the Stennis collection, which is a modern political papers collection. Uh, and I went and looked at the original and the, the person, the student looking for the document was correct. It was cited to Stennis for no good reason whatsoever. Uh, I think we should hold that up and be like, don't do this. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Um, at, at the state archives here, obviously we don't deal with students and think, we know we have a few interns here and there, but we're not dealing with students the way that university archives do, obviously. But, um, you know, I do talk to like my teacher friends who teach like K through 12. And, um, so hearing some of the stories about, um, their students and, you know, just the reliance on technology and all that. It seems like it's just like, like I, I feel for people who are working with this generation that are like very um, reliant on technology. And, you know, uh, I feel like I, I'm young, but like I was sort of, I remember before the internet and after the internet. So um, anyway, but uh, I, I wonder if you guys, do you think that, um, you know, it would be better to start introducing like high school students to primary sources. Do you think that that's something that would be, you know, um, e easy for them to understand? Do you think that would be helpful for when they get into college? I mean, I remember I was, I think a junior in college before I actually stepped foot in an archive. And that may just be because of the institution that I was in, it may vary, you know, from state to state, institution to institution, but um I'm curious what your thoughts are on um, archival research in like the high school age. I I think it would be helpful. I, I've seen so many students that are so scared to come into the archives, even as juniors and seniors. And I think introducing it earlier and making it not something to be afraid of, but also that those students are, you know, welcome to use primary sources and welcome in repositories that that provide access to primary sources would be really helpful. Um, we do do a little bit of um, of engagement with uh, high schoolers specifically for National History Day out here. So that is definitely really helpful just to get them in to the archives and, and just show them that they're supposed to be here. I think that translates really well um, in, in their college experience because then they already feel like they have a sense of belonging and a sense of knowing that you know these resources are for them. That's great. That's good to hear. I wish, you know, I came from a very small town, so, you know, I, there was a lot of things that I wasn't exposed to, but I do wish that I'd been able to be exposed to archives a little bit earlier, um, especially as a history buff, you know, I would I would have just nerded out so much. <laughs> I would like to comment on this. Um, Melinda Gill, I'm the college archivist at the College of Coastal Georgia, but I actually come from New England. Um, I was also introduced to the archives as an undergraduate student. And actually I attended NEA, New England Archi Archivist Conference. My first year I was introduced to archives and I was the only undergraduate student at the entire conference. And I also was on the panel while there because it was a panel about undergraduate research with archives. So while the rest of the panel were archivists, 
telling their side of the teaching, I give the perspective of the student learning about archives and how I got into the field and now I'm in the field today. So it is definitely something where it really isn't introduced into college, I feel like, and I think it would be beneficial for archives to be introduced in high school. But right now, because of the pandemic at my current institution, we are actually having trouble with our college students knowing how to use a library where they don't even know how to use the Library of Congress. They don't know how to find books. They don't know how to do general citations for their classes, never mind doing archival classes. They don't even know how to use a library right now. We are finding this because of the pandemic. A lot of them never went to their high school libraries because they just didn't have the exposure in high school because they were remote most of the time and their high schools didn't bring them to their libraries or they didn't even have libraries in their high schools. So it's definitely something where would I like the exposure earlier? Yes, but they need to know general research knowledge just for libraries before they're able to come into the archives. That's a great point. Anyone else like to ask any questions or add anything? We've got a few more minutes. If there are no more questions or comments or anything, um, we can go ahead and go for a, a few minutes early if you guys want. We can um, take about a 15 minute break and come back um, to our next session. Uh, thank you again to Claire and Kathleen for your presentation. Um, and yeah, we'll take a break and come back. <laughs> 